church and welcome neighbors. Uh, I'm glad to be able to spend a couple of minutes with you together. Um, and happy Mother's Day to um, all the moms out there. I'm uh, glad to be able to celebrate with you a little bit this morning. And, and uh, we've been in a series called Forgiving. And I think that that series is appropriate for um, family relationships. Um, we oftentimes forget on days of celebration to grieve um, things that have gone wrong in, in family relationships. And so um, if, you're, if you're that kind of mom, I just would encourage you uh, that, that it's okay to have grief. It's okay to bring those things to the Lord. Um, and all of that just to say that family relationships can be complicated. And Jesus was aware of that. Jesus addressed that. And uh, yeah, particularly when you get to relationships between parents and kids, mothers and children. And Jesus had a special soft place in his heart for kids. He, he saw something in them that was inherently valuable in how they approached the world and how they um, come to people with trust. And we've seen all different kinds of ways that that goes wrong. But in our, in our section, as we've been going through just a couple of chapters out of the middle of Matthew, um, our next section actually redirects our attention back to, um, back to children again. In Matthew 19 and verse 13, I'm just going to read it to you real quick. It says, Then children were brought to him that he might lay his hands on them and pray. The disciples rebuked the people, but Jesus said, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of heaven. And he laid his hands on them and went away. So we've got an instance where people are bringing their kids to Jesus and looking for this um, really a, a common uh, blessing is to, to you know, lay your hands on a child and, and, and give them a blessing and, and tell them that God is looking out for them. Um, and that he's going to have his hand on them in the future. And so people have brought their kids that Jesus might bless them. The disciples are getting frustrated. And Jesus points us back to where we started in our series that we've been calling Forgiving. And says, if you don't, if you, unless you come to God as though you are a child, with childlike faith and childlike humility, uh, then you have no part in the kingdom. Um, and that really opens up um, a fascinating discussion um, and we're going to jump forward just a little bit because, because in the context of this forgiving conversation, there is a, a story that seems disconnected to what it is that we've been driving at so far. But God uses a mother as a catalyst for taking the next step and opening up the next understanding of, of what it is that God wants us to understand about forgiving. And so I thought it would be great to just take a small jump forward and address this text today since it is Mother's Day as we're gathering together. Um, so we're going to be actually in Matthew chapter 20, and I'm going to begin in verse 20 of Matthew chapter 20. If you want to begin to navigate there, then I'd encourage you to do that. Um, but I'd like to pause first and, and, and pray together with you, if you join me in this prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So turn with me to Matthew chapter 20. We're going to look at uh, our next step in this forgiving series. And we're going to see in Matthew chapter 20, beginning in verse 20, that God uses a mother as a catalyst to get us to the next part of the conversation. So read with me, Matthew 20 and verse 20. Then the mother of the sons of Zebedee came up to him with her sons. And kneeling before him, she asked him for something. And he said to her, what do you want? She said to him, say that these two sons of mine are to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in your kingdom. I'm going to pause there and to kind of explain what's going on. So, so Jesus is actually on his way to Jerusalem. The verses just before this tell us that. And as he's going, he's talking with the disciples and teaching his disciples. And it seems like maybe they're going through a, a hometown or at least they're close to the sons of Zebedee's house, James and John. They have left their father's business 
um, being fishermen and they follow Jesus and they're, they're close enough to, to the hometown that, that James and John's mom comes up and approaches Jesus. She comes with humility and she has a question for him. And Jesus looks at her, he listens to her heart and says, what is it that you want? And her request is that say that these two sons of mine are to sit one at your right hand and one at your left in your kingdom. So Jesus, when you finish this thing that you started, would you give my two sons a position of honor? And I've heard d different discussions try to, try to say that she was doing a good thing or that she was doing a bad thing. And I don't think it's really helpful to pass judgment on whether or not her request was appropriate. But I'm thankful that at the very least, she comes to Jesus with an honest question, an honest concern. And maybe it's a concern that we might recognize either from our own mothering or from being a mother. She's concerned that these two boys have just completely thrown their lives away. And she wants to do what she can to help to set them up to have a good life. <sighs> They were part of a, a family business. They were partners in their father's business. They were fishermen on the Sea of Galilee. And this rabbi out of nowhere comes up and invites them to come and be fishers of men with him. And so they leave the business and they follow him around all over the country. And, and, and mom is now close enough to say, hey, hey, hey. Okay, rabbi, you're supposed to be becoming somebody. When, when, you, when you hit the big time, Will you give my boys a position of honor? Give them not just a position of honor, but the two best positions of honor, the seat of, uh, on the right hand and on the left, the advisory positions when you come into your kingdom. And I don't, I, it seems to me that she has, she has grasped the, the thrust of Jesus' message that he's been preaching, which is the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And she's saying, okay, when that kingdom shows up, when you establish your government on the earth, would you give my boys positions of prominence? Would you look out for them? And would you, would you, would you um, nominate them to be rulers in this kingdom that you're setting up? <clears throat> she's trying to, She's trying to mitigate what she may have initially perceived as a mistake that these boys made. She's got a desire to protect them. They've left everything to follow this Jesus guy. So she's trying to make sure, well, if you've already put all your eggs in this Jesus basket, maybe you should get an ROI on this. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go out on a limb and ask Jesus to do that for you. Um, we do this too sometimes. We forget that we have to let our loved ones make their own choices. Um, and when we're reminded, maybe we try to mitigate uh, the circumstances of the choices that people that we love have cared for. We might, we might, for the sake of our loved ones, try to manipulate other people in this situation to get a desirable outcome. Or <clears throat> we might try to shield our loved ones from the natural consequences of the decisions that they're making in hopes that they'll learn a lesson without having to experience the difficulty. We, we, this is our, this is, we perceive this to be compassionate to our loved ones, to try and, try and keep, them, uh, keep them afloat when it seems like they're going off on, on a ledge. And, and it comes from a good place, but maybe it isn't always the most helpful place. Especially if you're a parent, there can be times where it's difficult to trust that God is in control of your kid's life. We might be willing to say, yes, God's in control of my life and I trust him to take care of me and all of those kind of things. But when it comes to my kids, like, I don't know, like, can I actually trust God? I'm not so sure. Maybe I need to get involved in this. And, and we try to, to manipulate others and mitigate circumstances. So I wonder what it might look like to trust God's work, not just in our own lives, but in the lives of our loved ones. What does it look like to trust God's work in our loved ones' lives? <clears throat> I suspect there's a couple of features. There's probably lots of ways that this manifests. But, but I think if we're trusting God's work in other people's lives, particularly in our loved ones' lives, then we are going to have a habit of prayer. We are going to constantly be talking to God about the work that he's doing in our loved one's lives. We're going to be asking him to be active and to be proactive, and, and, and we're going to be talking with him consistently. There's going to be a habit of prayer for our loved ones. 
And I think we're also going to develop a habit of listening. When our loved ones come to us and they're explaining a decision that they're making or circumstances that they're navigating, if we're trusting God, the thing that our loved ones will receive from us is a listening ear. We can, we can listen to them without getting worked up and trying to, no, 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 you can't do that. You're going to screw your life up and you start to bring the hammer down on them. We, we can listen patiently and we can ask questions to get clarification. And sometimes just asking questions about uh, the details of the, this plan or whatever is working out is enough of, of caring concern that it might allow God to place new ideas and new directions into our loved one's heart. If we're trusting God, God's work in our loved one's lives, um, then perhaps we'd have a habit of prayer for them. And we'd, when they come to us, we could have an ear that listens and a heart that asks clarifying questions out of care and love. So she comes to Jesus, she asks for this favor, and, and Jesus, uh, Jesus asks some clarifying questions. Look with me in, uh, in Matthew chapter 20 and in verse 22. Jesus answered, Jesus answered, you do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I am to drink? And they said to him, we are able. <laughs> so, so Jesus answered, you do not know what you're asking. And then he turns his attention to the brothers and says, and asks them, are you able to drink the cup that I am to drink? And they said to him, we are able. And he said to them, you will drink my cup, but to sit at my right hand and at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared for my, prepared by my father. So Jesus answers the mom. He says, look, I, I'm so excited that you're, you're grasping this thing that I'm doing in the world. You've understood that my main message is I'm bringing the kingdom here. I'm establishing my kingdom. It is beginning. It is breaking through. And yet it's not the kind of kingdom that you are expecting it to be. And he asks the brothers, are you able to drink the cup that I'm going to drink? And that's kind of a weird picture for us. Um, but he's actually uh, referring to some, some Hebrew scriptures. He's referring to an idea in the Old Testament of the cup of God's wrath. We see this picture in Jeremiah chapter 25 is a pretty extended conversation about what the cup of what it means to drink the cup of God's wrath. Psalm 75 verses 6 and 7, uh, 6 through 7 talk about it in a poetic way. And Isaiah 51 talks about it in another extended passage. This idea that God's wrath is a cup of wine and that God may force people who are rebelling against him to drink this cup of wine and get intoxicated so they're not even able to stand on their own two feet. They stagger and they fall because God's going to humiliate them if they're not willing to humble themselves before him. And Jesus asked, are you able to drink the cup that I'm going to drink? Like, I haven't earned the cup of God's wrath, but I am getting ready to drink it. Are you able to drink that? They're like, yeah, yeah, we can do that. And he says, well, you're gonna. And so it's interesting. Looking at it from our perspective, we kind of know how the story develops. We know that Jesus is going to be crucified. And so we, and, and we can infer that James and John are going to be martyred and they're going to be tortured for their following of Jesus and their refusal to deny that he was the Son of God and he made a way for salvation. Um, they don't know what's getting ready to happen, even though Jesus has already told them. In fact, in Matthew, in this same chapter, the verses right before we began in 17 through 19, and as Jesus was going up to Jerusalem, he took the 12 disciples aside and on the way he said to them, see, we are going up to Jerusalem and the son of man will be delivered over to the scribes, the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles to be mocked and flogged and crucified and he will be raised on the third day. Jesus has already told them, and this is actually the third time that he's told them, I'm going to die. I'm going to suffer when we get to Jerusalem. And they don't quite get it yet. And so Jesus is saying, can you suffer with me? They say, yeah, for sure. We totally can. But they don't quite get what he means yet. They'll understand at some point, um, but they don't know what, it, what it's going to cost them. 
And counting the cost is a, is a big component of forgiving. We've already seen that Jesus makes us forgivers as we see how we have been forgiven. That Jesus was willing to drink the cup of God's wrath, not just take a sip of it, but drink the whole glass, the whole cup, all the way down to the dregs, the bitter part at the bottom of the glass. Jesus will drink all of that down in order to exchange his life for ours. And Jesus makes us forgivers. He gives us a humble attitude when we see how much we have been forgiven. We've already seen that in Matthew 18. And so forgiving means accepting the pain of an offense, but simultaneously trusting God's hand in it. See, whether or not we're willing to forgive is going to indicate what's going on in our hearts about who it is that we're trusting to be in control of my life. If I'm in control of my life, then I am the one who has to pay back to you the sin that you did against me. But if God's in control, I can extend to you forgiveness and trust that God is going to be the one who makes everything right. Whether I see it in this life or whether he takes care of it in the last day, I can trust that God is good and just and he is going to sort things out and I don't have to be the one that sorts it out. Which leads us to our big idea. By entrusting our life to God, we are humbled to serve the undeserving. By entrusting our life to God, we are humbled to serve the undeserving. And I'll, I'll focus in on this first part here because that's what we have highlighted so far. This, this mother has come to Jesus and she's not quite sure she can trust him with her boy's future. So she's asking, hey, let me make sure that the boys are going to get a good return on their investment for following you, Jesus. Would you give them positions of authority and power when you're done with the work that you're doing? I don't know that I can trust you. But by entrusting our life to God, he's going to do things that shape our heart. He's going to change our heart. When we turn our lives over to him, things are going to be different for us. When he gives us his life, our life is reshaped. So are, what are we hesitating to trust God to handle? What are we hesitating to trust God to handle? The first thing is, have we entrusted our life to God? Have we said, okay, God, like I've been going through this and, and I've been going through and going through and trying to live my life and be a good person the best that I can. But every time I come to your word, I realize, man, I'm not a good person. And, and if it's not just about doing the right thing, but having the right attitude, then I keep falling short. And I don't know how that I can be a good enough person to get on your good side. So I just give you my whole life. I'm entrusting my life to you, God. Do with it what you will. Save me in spite of myself. What are we hesitating to trust God to handle? It might be relationships. It could be parental relationships. It could be hurt from the past, people who have hurt us and, and seems like they got away with it. Can we trust God, that God is at work in other people's lives and can we forgive them for the hurt they've done to us because God is the one who's in control? Or are we hesitating to trust God to handle a worldwide pandemic? Or are we hesitating to trust God to handle politicized responses to a worldwide pandemic? Can we trust that God is in control? And can we serve him quietly and faithfully with our part that he's asked us to handle? By entrusting our life to God, we are humbled to serve the undeserving. What, Michael, what are, you, what are you getting that from? Actually, I'm getting it from where Jesus takes this conversation next. Look with me in Matthew chapter 20. Again, and I'm going to read in verse 24 to the rest of this passage. <clears throat> so they've had, Jesus has had this conversation with James and John and their mom. And in verse 24, and when the ten heard it, the, other, the ten other disciples, the ten other apostles, when the ten heard it, they were indignant at the two brothers. But Jesus called them to him and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. It shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be your slave. 
even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. So the other disciples hear what's going on in this conversation, and they're angry. And maybe they're thinking, why didn't I think to ask that? Or maybe they're thinking, I can't believe those two mommy's boys are like sucking up to Jesus, letting their mom suck up to Jesus so that they can get a better position. But they're angry. And Jesus says, look, you guys are vying for position. You guys are trying to shore things up for when all of this is over. But you've misunderstood what my kingdom is built on. My kingdom is built on humility. And forgiving begins with humility. He, said, he says there's a, small, there's a small change in English, the words here, but they're all in every English translation, you'll see that there's a, a Greek word change here. He says, it shall not be so among you, in verse 26, whoever shall, would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever must, would be first among you must be your slave. So servant and slave, he's actually using two different vocabulary words. A servant is is a voluntary career. This is somebody who's chosen to move into somebody's house and to become their servant. A slave is, is, is an involuntary consequence of bad choices. Often people would be made slaves when... Um, an invading army, an invaded roaming army took over and, and the people would be brought back as a slave. They didn't get a choice. They were just put into slavery and they had to serve. Or maybe if a person got into deep enough debt, their debt, the person that they owed a debt to would sell them into slavery and they would be a slave. So the, Jesus takes the two lowest rungs, two of the lowest rungs in Jewish society as, as like the people that do not have it together and the people who are really scraping the bottom of the barrel. He says, this is who you need to use your model to live by. You think you're going to be the greatest. You're going to vie for position. You're going to be the greatest by lording each other's authority over you, but you've misunderstood the servants. The people who have chosen a voluntary career of serving other people, they are the ones who are great. And the slaves, the ones who have these involuntary consequences to their actions, they are the ones who I'm going to hold up as as examples for you. Because the Son of Man, the most human one of all, came not to be served but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. The Son of Man, God in the flesh, came down not on a royal litter being carried by his servants, not in a carriage being drawn by horses, not to be given honor. The Son of Man didn't come to be served. He came to serve. He came to be the one carrying somebody else on a litter. He came to be the horse drawing the carriage. The ones who would get no attention, that's the one who Jesus came to model his life after. And by entrusting our life to God, we are humbled to serve the undeserving. (laughs) Jesus is not the way and the truth to the best life now. He set the example of serving and suffering for us to follow. And 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 1 through 11 makes that absolutely explicit. Jesus is not the way and the truth to the best life now. He set the example of serving and suffering for us to follow. And he exchanged his life for ours. The Son of Man came instead of us came to suffer what we would suffer instead of us. He came to be the opposite of what he earned for himself. He came to be a ransom for many. And that's the example that he leaves for us. So who are we overlooking the opportunity to serve? Could be our family and friends. And right now you might have way more of your family and friends than you really are comfortable with. The people closest to you can be the easiest to overlook in how you serve them and how you love them. And I think moms are a great example, oftentimes, of serving selflessly and thanklessly. And which is one of the reasons why culturally we've taken this day to celebrate their work. Maybe it's our neighbors that we're neglecting the opportunity to serve. 
We can read about headlines of people, different groups of people who are suffering, who are grieving, who are struggling, and we can write that off as, oh, that doesn't have to deal with me. Those people are just making a big stink over nothing. And we can neglect to turn compassionately toward them, to lift them up in prayer, to weep with those who weep, and to mourn with those who mourn. Who are we overlooking the opportunity to serve? Because by entrusting our life to God, we are humbled to serve the undeserving. It's not who deserves our forgiveness, who deserves our compassion, who deserves my life. Because the motto that Jesus left for us is to serve the undeserving. And by entrusting my life, by entrusting our lives to God, we are humbled to serve the undeserving.